as you probably know, we're um, in the middle of a series where we're looking at the um, a great Buddhist text, the writings of um, of the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha, both from him and, and then from people that come after him as well. So there was a whole series we did on the teachings of what's known as the Pali Canon. We're now doing that in the Mahayana, in the middle of the Mahayana, and in the autumn we go into the Vajrayana or the Tantric series. So uh, something to look forward to there, a bit of Tantric, whatever, is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, we're in the Mahayana. And um, in this series of um, talks about um, the Mahayana texts, we've come to what's known as the perfection of wisdom texts, and to a figure who's called Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, okay. So um, he was a, um, a philosopher who really changed the way that people thought about um, the Buddhist thought. He was one of the major philosophers, I think, of, of, um, of human history. And, um, but the important thing for him and the Buddha was not a philosophy for its own sake, however interesting that might be. They were both pragmatists. And what they both wanted to do was teach what leads us towards freedom. So Buddhist texts are about freedom. So all the texts that we've been looking at in this series and we'll look at, the whole point of them is that they are leading us towards um, a freedom of mind and of being. And um, the Buddha said that um, all the Dharma, all his teachings, have the taste of freedom. Just like the ocean has the taste of salt, all his teachings have the taste of freedom. So you might ask, freedom from what? Freedom to do what? What kind of freedom are we talking about? So it's freedom from living our lives ruled by our own cravings, by our hatred and dislike, by our automatic and conditioned responses. So that experience, you know, of your mind just going round and round, of living in a way where you're just trying to get a bit more pleasure, push the pain away, um, finding ourselves behaving in ways that leads to more suffering for others and more suffering from ourselves. So it's moving, it's freedom, from that way of just going round and round. And the free freedom that we move towards is a spaciousness of mind, a spaciousness in our mind, in our hearts, so that we can respond creatively and appropriately to whatever situation we find ourselves in. So we can act in ways where there's less suffering for ourselves and for others, where we are opening up our awareness, our kindness, and our love for others. So moving away from this going round and round trapped to a freedom. So um, in a way you can see all these texts we've been talking about through the whole series as being a whole set of get out of jail cards. So they're ways to move from being in this prison of our own mind. There's a phrase from the poet William Blake which is mind forged manacles. So we can move from being imprisoned by these mind forged manacles out towards the freedom of a spacious and loving mind. I think mind forged manacles is a great phrase. So much of our suffering comes from our own minds. Each of these texts shines a different light on the, how we might break out of those manacles, a different way to pick the lock, you might say, of those manacles and get out into the freedom. So today we're learning from Nagarjuna. So he, as I said, he's had a very powerful influence on the history of Buddhism. He's even been called the second Buddha, and his teachings have been called the second turning of the wheel of the Dharma. But actually, for someone who was so influential, we don't know much about Nagarjuna himself. He lived about 1,700 years ago, perhaps in India, so about six or 700 years after the Buddha. And his name, Nagarjuna, means um, noble serpent or dragon. And the myth is that the Buddha, that these teachings actually come originally from the Buddha, um, but that he hid them deep down in the ocean with the Nagas. And he hid them there until such time as there was a person who could understand them and um, express them to other people, and until the world was ready for them as well. So the, the Nagas are mythical dragons, serpents, and um, live deep down in the oceans. And the story goes that um, Nagarjuna was able to um, go to the ocean, and the king of the Nagas saw that he was a person who could really... And do something with his teachings. And so the, his daughter, the princess, the princess of the Nagas, gave the teachings to Nagarjuna. So I think what that myth, that story tells us, is that although we're talking about ideas here, 
It's important to realise it's not intellectualising thought for the sake of it. It's the wisdom of knowing from the deepest part of ourselves. So the Nagas are those deepest parts of ourselves, the unconscious, the ocean is the unconscious. It's actually bringing into our consciousness stuff that's deep down in us. It's deep down knowing. So Nagarjuna and his followers, uh, his followers established what's called the Magyar Marker School. So that's Magyar Marker. And it just means middle way, or actually literally apparently middling. Which sounds to me, because I'm not from Yorkshire, like a really good Yorkshire word, like a kind of, well, how are you? Well, I'm middling. Or uh, <laughs> what kind of school are you from? Well, I'm from the middling school. <laughs> so it's the middling school. But it certainly doesn't mean middle of the road or kind of some kind of compromise at all. That's not what is meant by, middle, by the middle school here, or the middle way. So Nagarjuna himself said the teachings, actually his teachings came from the Buddha. And I think there's something really important that, which is about the principle of, um, of the Dharma, which is that, of course, the Buddha um, was um, the first Buddha to awaken and teach us in this time. But then other people have also understood those teachings and have been able to teach them as well. We've got a saying, which is the Dharma is um, caught, not taught. So knowing about the ideas of the Dharma is not the same as actually living them. So Nagarjuna, in a way, was an embodiment of Buddhism, of the principle of awakening, the principle of the Buddha. Um, and what he was able to do was shape Buddhism up a bit, which it needed. So what happens with uh, Buddhism, as with all human endeavours, is like somebody comes along, really gets things going, is really in touch with reality. And then everything starts slowly to sink back into a kind of settling down. People become really good Buddhists and they just follow all the rules and that kind of stuff. And, but they're not really understanding it. They're not really knowing it. And it needs someone to come along and shake it all up again. And that is what Nagarjuna did. And that's what needs to continue happening over history. We need to keep uh, looking at ourselves, I suppose. Are we settling down? Are we just doing things by um, rote and ritual? And actually shaking it up and looking that we're doing it from the principles of it. Okay, so, pranya wisdom. Let's go back to the other. So this word, pranya paramita, that is the name of the text, the group of texts that Nagarjuna and his followers taught. So they're a really massive group of, um, of texts. Some of them are very long indeed, like 100,000 lines. Some of them are very short. Apparently one of them is just the letter A. <laughs> so that's one of the teachings, so they go from very small to very big. Um, the, um, probably the Pranya Paramita teaching that we know most is the Heart Sutra. So that if you've done a sevenfold puja and you've heard the um, Heart Sutra being recited, or I think for those people under 35 who went to the uh, study group on Saturday, they also had a chance to study the Heart Sutra as well. So that's the, probably that's, it's a Pranya Paramita, Paramita teaching, probably the one we know the best. So pranya means wisdom, paramita means perfect. But it's a wisdom which is not just an intellectual knowing, it's a means, uh, it means a knowledge of things as they really are in their ultimate depth, their ultimate transcendental dimension. And perfect is not kind of perfect, can sound a bit kind of neat and closed off, it's not that at all, it just means complete whole. So it's the whole knowing of reality. So these texts are about trying to communicate to us the whole knowing, a whole knowing of reality. And the Pranya Paramita texts have been written from the point of view of someone who sees the world as the Buddha described it. So it's a world in which there's no thing and nobody has a genuine existence of itself. And in which the words we use to describe our experience don't point to anything which is ultimately real. So what the uh, Paramita, Param, Pranya Paramita texts do is they shift back and forth. So there are times when they come from a transcendental perspective, um, and then there are times when they come back to our usual point of view. They play with language. And what they do is they set up a whole kind of baffling contradictions, paradoxes. So if you've chanted the Heart Sutra or looked at it, you'll see that quite a lot of it, you're thinking, well, what does this mean? It's really baffling. And it's there on purpose to baffle us. And they're actually, they're quite impossible to understand without some kind of, ex of explanation. 
Though interestingly, quite often people can have quite a, just a, an intuitive or an emotional response to things like the Heart Sutra. I certainly know the, the first few times I heard it, I had no idea what it meant, but it meant something to me, it had some kind of power to me. So this school, this school, this the Pranya Paramita, the Majimaka school that, um, that wrote these texts, what they did is they used language and logic to show the limits of language and logic, okay? With the intention of leading us to a state beyond language. So I'm going to talk about it using language. Okay? <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, and, but um, Nagarjuna and his followers, you know, they covered a huge, as you can imagine, for someone who's seen as actually kind of um, making a massive influence on Buddhist thought, a change in Buddhist thought, they covered a lot of material. Uh, you could probably do a whole series of talks on it. So I'm just going to concentrate on two areas that Nagarjuna talked about. So Shunyata, and then two levels of reality. So Shunyata. So shunyata is um, sometimes translated as emptiness. It's important just to realize to and um, see that although Nagarjuna and his followers really brought out this whole idea of shunyata, it's not that they invented it or anything like that. It was in the Buddha's original teachings. It's just they really emphasized it and looked at and applied it to the whole of our experience. So what shunyata is saying is that all phenomena, all things, are empty of inherent existence. So nothing exists of its own accord in an unchanging way. There's no soul or essence to anything. So this idea of shunyata comes out of the Buddha's understanding when he was enlightened. So that what he saw when he was enlightened was um, he had a sense of um, reality being made up of a whole web of conditions, what we call conditioned co-production whole web of conditions of flow. So everything that exists comes into being and then goes out of being comes from this web of conditions. Things come into being, they pass away. They have no essence. Everything is interconnected. And actually this translation emptiness is not a very good translation for Shunyata because it carries too much sort of negative connotations for us to do it, really do it justice. Some people have said it's better to translate Shunyata as mystery, the mystery. Because it actually what it does is it reminds us we don't understand existence. And it points us towards the wonder of the world that we live in. To say that all things are the mystery probably gets closer to the intended effect than to say all things are empty. So the vision of Shunyata is one of interconnectedness, openness, infinite potential. So sometimes actually people even think that fullness might be a really good translation for it because of this infinite potential. Interestingly, shunya apparently is the word that they still use, I think in Hindi, for zero. So the idea is like, because um, zero is interesting because it's nothing, but yet there's a potentiality in that. It's a kind of interesting concept. So shunyata. So I'm going to try and use the word shunyata rather than emptiness so we don't get too um, kind of nihilistic and be caught up in thinking that nothing exists at all. So this idea of shunyata, we can apply it to everything. So we can apply it to lecterns, to stages, to cushions, to mountains, to amoebas, to whatever. This lectern here was once a tree. Um, it grew as some kind of a tree, it was cut down, and now it's what we call a lectern. And one day we'll decide we don't want it anymore, or the Buddha Centre won't be here anymore, or it'll stop working or something, and we'll probably cut it to pieces and burn it, perhaps. I don't know, that might be what happens to it. Or the wood might get used for something else, I don't know. And then in time, that might decay and get used for something else. So although it's something that we call a lectern now, it itself, you couldn't say where it starts or where it stops. You see what I mean? And there were all the conditions that came into being to make it happen. So there was, um, for the tree to grow, someone probably planted the tree. And then there needed to be sunshine, there needed to be rain, there needed to be nutrients in the soil. Um, somebody needed to decide to, they were going to cut it down. Someone needed to design the lectern. Someone at the Buddhist centre needed to decide they were going to buy it. Uh, wherever it came from, I don't know where it came from actually. Acquire it and um, put it here so that we could use it. 
So there's, and then all those conditions that led to that person having that money, deciding that's what they're going to do with it. There's just a huge number of conditions that mean that this particular thing is standing here right now. And although that's a kind of like really interesting to think about how that applies to, you know, the whole of um, all, all, all phenomena, I think it's particularly relevant and particularly freeing when we apply it to people. Because we, of course, are also impermanent, like the lectern is, and we are at the kind of nexus of a whole web of conditions that means that, all, that each of us is here. We're, you know, we're always changing. So you could see how our bodies are, are made up of a number of conditions, a number of things that have come into being. So the most kind of, um, that come, as it were, from outside us. So the, uh, the one that's changing the most, perhaps, is us breathing. So at the moment, we're all breathing in the air in this room, and we're breathing out. And actually, we're probably, because we're sitting quite close together, breathing in the same air and breathing it out. So it's something's coming into our bodies, and it's going out. Without that air, we wouldn't be able to breathe. So there's a sense that you can see how our, the oxygen in our bodies is made up, comes from the outside. You could say the same about the calcium in my bones. It has come from things that I've eaten. Without that calcium, I wouldn't be able to have, um, have bones. And one day when I die, those bones will gradually rot or will be burnt or whatever, and they will pass back into the earth. So there's like a flow of conditions there as well. Um, the, um, the blood in my body comes from a mixture of things, doesn't it? Water, iron, all sorts of things have come together. They've come from other places, and they will, you know, it passes away from my body as well. So what I'm trying to say is you can see how we are in this kind of whole web of conditions. And as well as our bodies, that's true for our thoughts and our emotions. All our thoughts and emotions are conditioned. By that I mean that they have come from the past or they've come from somebody else. It's not like we somehow, I mean occasionally we have good ideas, don't we? They might even be original ideas, but you know when you have an original idea, it only comes from all those other kind of ideas that you've heard during your life. So it's a bit like we are just, in the same way that you know, um, air and water flows through our bodies, so do our thoughts, our ideas, our emotions. They are coming from this web that we are within. So our thoughts are shunyata as well. The freeing thing about that is it means we don't need to identify with them. We really don't need to identify with them. So probably everyone has had the experience, particularly I tend to get it at like 4 o'clock in the morning, of just that, you know, with thoughts are going around my head and I'm getting myself really anxious, you know, what if this, what if that, that, that kind of thought. Well, actually, those are just the product of conditions. I do not need to identify with those thoughts. I can let them go. Or you might have thoughts which are things like, um, I'm really dreadful and everyone else is great, or, um, oh my God, I'm such a bad person, or something like that. Or you might think, I'm a great person and I'm really wonderful. Whatever you're thinking, they're just thoughts. They're just thoughts, and they are the result of conditions. They do not exist from their side. They are shunyata. And so that's really freeing. That's really freeing because, um, you know, we get so many, so much of our suffering comes from those thoughts that we have and those feelings that we have, and we believe them to be true. And often they just come from, you know, all sorts of ridiculous places. I... I read something in a book recently which I thought was really interesting how, um, so once upon a time, I suppose, we lived like in much smaller groups of people, didn't we? And um, we didn't have the mass media. So a young man who grew up in a tribe of maybe 250 people or something, when he got to be about 16 or something, he probably, he would, he would see that he was like, um, you know, much more manly than all the, the young boys, and he would see that he was um, much stronger than the older men. So he probably had a sense of himself as quite strong, quite handsome in comparison. Do you see what I mean? Whereas nowadays, of course, we, have, we see the most beautiful men in the media, and that is who men will compare themselves with, I presume. I mean, it's only what women do. I don't know. So, so you just see what I mean? So it's like, it's all, it's not, what I'm trying to get at is that it's not true. It's not true. It's all comparison. It's all relative. It's not that those men in those tribes were more or less beautiful than men are now, or handsome or strong. It's just they could see themselves as being that because they didn't have all around them other things to compare them with. 
So, you know, if you go to one sort of school, you probably think you're, you're quite clever. But if you went to a different school, you might think you're quite stupid. Does that make sense? Or, you know, you might think you're quite clever most of your life, and then you find yourself in a situation where everyone else is even more clever, and then suddenly you're not clever anymore. It's, it's, it's all, none of it is real. It is all, um, it's shunyata. It's shunyata. Yet we believe it. We believe it. We go round and round believing it, and we give ourselves such a lot of suffering. And, of course, we believe it about other people as well. So, um, and we think they're a certain way as well, and that gives us suffering too. So why do we do that in a way? What a kind of weird thing to do. Because actually, what we do, interestingly as humans, is we make something out of nothing, which is quite clever, because we are just this flow of conditions. We're just a flow of conditions of uh, physical things, ideas, thoughts, all just flowing through us. But what we do is we separate out. We separate out from that flow. So you could think of a human life or existence as being like a river. So there's a flow of things going on. And in that flow, there are little eddies, aren't there? Little whirlpools. And it's a bit like one of those eddies or whirlpool you could call such a jetty. You could call me one of those um, little eddies or whirlpools. Because I'm actually part of the river. But I do have a distinct shape and identity that you can say, there's such a jyoti. But what we do is we, in a way, turn that eddy into, one way of saying it is we turn it into ice. We try and freeze it. We try and make it uh, um, a, uh, a such a jyoti that is no longer changing. We try and make something permanent, something that's going to last forever in there. Something that is separate as well from the rest of it. One way is you can see it as being like you're freezing into ice. Or you could see it as being like you try and dam off that eddy, so you keep it separate from everything else from the water. But of course, water that is left um, outside flowing water, it stagnates, doesn't it? It stagnates and it gets really smelly and disgusting. So I think that's a really good image for me of what happens when I do this thing of trying to identify with, become, per make permanent, make me, make separate something in my existence from the rest of the river. And we do that quite a lot of the time. So every time I feel threatened in some way by something, by, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm doing the comparison thing, that I'm not as good at this as somebody else, but I will be damning off that eddy. I will be kind of going, I'm a certain way. Or every time I um, really crave something unhelpful, I'm going to be identifying, if I identify with that craving, I'm going to be damning off that eddy. That makes sense. So it's a bit like what I'm doing all the time that I, I, I do what we call, you can call it self clinging. It's where you cling to this idea of self that's separate. And suffering comes from that because once I've got a sense of myself as being anything separate from the flow and I start to need to protect it, then I start to get really scared that other people might um, threaten that. So that um, then I have the whole thing that builds up around that of fear, trying to protect the sense of myself separate from the river, when all the time I'm just part of the river and I really didn't need to bother. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so that is, um, it, so in a way, all that stuff we do where we're creating a sense of a separate self, it's completely human. Every human does it, but it is where so much of our suffering comes from and we can learn to let go of it. Um, and in fact, you know, coming back to the idea that all these texts are about freedom, we can find freedom when we see the shunyata of our thoughts, our feelings. We see the shunyata of separating ourselves out from the rest of this river, from the river of, um, of our lives, really, from other people. And something that I think is really interesting is that actually we don't do it all the time. So you might be doing it right now, you might be thinking, oh, whatever it is about yourself or me or something like that, but you might not be. You might just be listening and you might just be in a flow where you're not doing any of that self-clinging. You're not doing any identifying with a sense of anything. And for me, that's really interesting when I, I learned that because it's something about a lot of the time we are free. We don't even realise it. And that's really good to know because it's good to know that we're not stuck all the time in this kind of iced up or stagnant pool. A lot of the time we are just in the river. We can do it. It's not something abnormal for us to be free. Okay? We can be free. <laughs> okay. So, a 
Well, not that I didn't plan to say, actually. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, for Nagarjuna, let's go back to Nagarjuna. So he said that all our views about the world are based on what he called false discrimination and prepancha. So false discrimination is vikalpa. So let's look briefly at vikalpa. So what he says, so we live in this, this flow of events, of, um, of conditions. We live in a web of things coming to being, passing away. But what we have to do, or what we do do, is we divide this process of existence up into ar arbitrary parts. And we give them names. Now we have to do that, don't we? So I have to call that something the lectern. I have to call myself something. And that's fine that we divide the world up into parts. But then we give them names and we believe them. The problem is when we believe that they're separate. So it's not a problem that things have names. Of course they have names. It's not a problem in a way that we separate out. The problem is when we believe that that means that things are separate from each other. And um, we, we assume that these words, and sometimes in the Pranya Paramata Sutras, they call these words mere play words. So they're play words. The idea of we can have words, but we can just hold them lightly. The problem is, is when we assume that these words point to something real, which has its own inherent qualities, which are either, de either desirable or undesirable. So some concepts we might have, some words we might have are things like strong or weak, fat or thin, clever, stupid. So those things are not inherently existing of themselves. As I've tried to say, they are just relative. Yet we give them words, which is helpful, because we sometimes need to say, I don't know, the fat jug or the thin jug or something like that, we need it. But then we start to give those words qualities that they don't actually have. And once we've done that on this basis, we start to do what we call propansion. And I think propancha, in terms of freedom, is a place where we definitely lose our freedom when we do propancha. Propancha is when your mind just goes off. You know, when your mind goes off and it starts to build false constructions. It starts to build castles in the sky, just based on things that don't even really exist, arbitrary entities and their imaginative qualities. Imaginary qualities, their imaginary qualities. So it's a bit like, you know, we kind of get a sense of I don't know, something that's quite good, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, like nations are interesting, aren't they? Nations. So we um, have an idea that there's something that's called England, okay? And um, loads of millions of people have given their lives for England. Yeah, it is just a concept. It's just an idea, you know? It's like, it's, England is an idea. It's made up of lots of different parts, isn't it? It's part of Great Britain. It's just this whole, so much in there. But yet, from that idea, We've imagined it to be a real thing that is worth dying for. I mean, I kind of feel like I've gone on a bit of a tangent here because I suppose you could have an argument that maybe in some ways it was and it is. But, at the, but I'm trying to get at the sense that there are things that we give them names and then we think they exist. Okay. And what we can do with propancha, so just normal propancha could be, you know, you see someone that's walking down the road and they don't say hello to you and you think, they don't like me. The reason they don't like me is because I... Really, last time I saw them, I said something really stupid to them. Oh my God, I'm such a stupid person. Oh my God, I better just go and hide in my room and not inflict myself on anybody else today. And that's all from the fact that someone's just not wearing their glasses today. <laughs> so, like, I mean, that's what propensity can do to us. It can just lead us, lead us into somewhere where we are behaving in a certain way and it's based on something that isn't true. And, and we often... Well, all the time in some ways, we are giving things imagined qualities that they really don't have. So there are things like success. We worry. I worry. Have I been successful with my life? Have I used my life to its most potential? It's kind of just an invented thing, isn't it? You know, how can one define it? I could define success in many different ways. I could define using my life to its most potential in many different ways. And on some days I'll hit them and some days I won't. It is completely, you know, I think my mum's idea of success and my idea of success are two different things, for instance. It's just like, you know, success, what does it mean? Reputation, similar. 
Approval, approval. There's a concept that is, um, you know, if you, if you just break it down and look at what approval means. Who's approval? What are they going to approve of? How am I going to know if they've approved? Etc. Etc. And one actually, that I've just been on a retreat, which really came out strongly for me, was um, it's not fair. I had this strong sense of being about six and going, it's not fair. And I realised quite a lot of my, and interestingly, after I'd felt this in this meditation, I came out and there's a rotor on the wall. And some people had signed up for the same jobs twice. <laughs> it was a job. And I thought to myself, it's not fair. So let's just, there's a kind of concept that I've created that actually is empty of any um, actual meaning. But yeah, I was having all sorts of anger and stuff around it, looking at people in a kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and what happens with mental proliferation, what happens with um, thinking it's not fair or whatever we think, is that we can miss out on what's going on. So I'm sure we've all had the experience of, you know, you're in quite a beautiful place or you're just an ordinary place. Do you notice the sunshine and the flowers? No, because what I'm thinking about is, it's not fair, you know, for whatever it is. Or, did they approve of me? Did they like me? It's all just in my mind. It is, you know, it is empty of any real existence. And actually, um, I think we can find beauty anywhere if we let go of those thoughts, you know? Um, I used to do a thing when I used to walk to work through, um, not a very pretty part of Sheffield, and um, I used to sort of walk, you know how I walk through full of, oh, when I get to work, there's this, there's that, all that kind of stuff. And then I'd go, no, stop and look around. And I was often amazed by what beauty I could see, even if it was just the reflection in a car, or a bit of blue paint on a door, or something like that. It was amazing that just by stopping the propension, dropping the propension, what beauty there was, and how enjoyable that was. And then I didn't need the propension so much. So that's propension. Um, yeah, and actually, um, the guardian have pointed out that as well as those kind of things I've been talking about, words that we use on the spiritual path like wisdom or faith, purity, they're also empty of intrinsic meaning. They're also qualities that are, you know that don't exist in their own right because they're relative qualities. They depend on comparison with the opposite. So it's a bit like everything. I think you see that in the Heart Sutra, don't you? People who know the Heart Sutra. In the Heart Sutra, we um, say, you know, even the Four Noble Truths, even the path to lead from suffering, it too is empty of intrinsic meaning. And what, what we can do with Nagarjuna's uh, deconstruction is actually we can see it like a sword. We can cut through those layers of propulsion and it can allow us to get back to what is real. So we can get back, get used to experiencing the world as it really is. Um, there's, a, there's a phrase that the um, ascetic Bahaya used, which is in the scene, sorry, it's the Buddha spoke to, to Bahaya and said, in the scene, only the scene, in the herd, only the herd, in the imagined, only the imagined. So it means that what we are doing is we're just being with what is actually happening. And I think meditation is such a useful place to be able to do that. If we can get ourselves on a retreat or we can get ourselves in a good place to meditate, we can let the propancha drop away and we can just experience what is actually going on for us. Yeah. So, and as I said before, um, from this grows freedom. From letting go of propancha grows freedom. We stop identifying with our thoughts. They just come from conditions and from various triggers. They aren't true. You know, obviously thoughts can be really useful. I'm using thoughts right now. You're probably thinking right now. So they can be helpful. I'm not saying thoughts are intrinsically bad. The problem is when thoughts lead us away from reality, when they lead us into these fantasies. Okay, so if the ultimate truth, as um, Nagarjuna said, is beyond words, and it's not true that I ultimately, ultimately exist, or that you ultimately exist. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? Well, the gardener really helpfully um, distinguished two levels of truth. Absolute truth and the relative or conventional truth. Okay, so um, absolute truth. 
that's what we've been talking about, the indescribable way that things are. We can't talk about it in words or concepts. Um, it can't be arrived at by reasoning. That's the absolute truth. The relative truth is the map of the world that's provided by the words and concepts we use to, to describe and explain. So we are using words and concepts. We are living in the world of um, relative truth. And um, so there's two levels, a level of absolute truth and a level of relative truth. So what is this relative truth? So all of us, of course, have a model of the world in our heads. We have to have a set of ideas and concepts of images, analogies, interpretations, metaphors that we use to make sense of the world and to guide our actions. And we each have our own, our own separate map of reality that we use to find our way around the world. And we have to have a simplified map, because reality is incredibly complex, isn't it? It's so complex. All that's just happening in this room right now is very complex in terms of all the visual and all the sensory kind of information that's going on, um, let alone ideas about how we should live our lives, um, how we relate to people, all those kind of things. What we have is we have maps that give us an idea of how to behave. And um, these maps are not reality. So the maps are not reality. And what they have is they have a similar relationship to um, reality that, say, a map of the Peak District would have. So if you went out for a walk right now, you went up into the peaks, up into onto Kinder or something like that, it's really useful to have a map that shows you where the path is and shows you where um, the rivers are and the valleys and things like that so you can find your way around. But if you were to look at the map and you were to look at reality, they would be very different, wouldn't they? You wouldn't go up onto Kinder, onto a, one, you know, for walk in the Peak District, and um, just be looking at the map. You could just stay at home and do that. You would need to look at the map and then put it away and take in the purple heather, the blue sky, the um, skylarks, whatever it is. You need to take it in, be in the reality. So that's what our maps, our uh, relative truth, are compared to the absolute truth. And um, we need to have these maps, and if they're accurate, that's really helpful for finding our way around. But if they're inaccurate, they're really useless. So if, if we've got an inaccurate map of the world, well, we're going to get really lost, aren't we? So if you've got a map, you know, I don't know, of how to get from here to um, Crooks or something, and it starts by saying, go downhill, you're going to be in problem. That's probably quite. Is that right? That is right. So let's go down. <laughs> you're going to have. You're going to be in problems because you're going in completely the wrong direction. For people who don't know where Crooks is, it's uphill from here. So, <laughs> you know, if it's inaccurate, it will lead you in completely the wrong way, and you'll end up kind of, you know, however hard I try to get to Crooks, if I've started off by going downhill, it's going to be quite hard to find my way back. So it's really important to have as good a map as we can of reality because the maps we have, these ideas of what reality is, they have a really big effect on us. They really affect the way that we feel and they really affect the way we live our life. Because our beliefs can liberate us, they can be free, or they can keep us stuck. And actually, even more than that, they can keep us in downward spirals of negativity, can't they? So there's that kind of, we probably all know the kind of depressive thinking which just keeps us down, you know? it's like. We've got a map of the world in which things are dark, things are awful, I'm awful, the world is awful, and we believe that map, and that just keeps us, we keep living in a world where things are awful. Um, or we could have a map when we're feeling much more um, positive, and we're much more connected to things, it's a sunny day, and we've fallen in love, and all that kind of stuff, and it's just like, the whole, you know, everything would be much more beautiful, the map would be a different map. And those beliefs we have, beliefs we have about how things are, they really will determine what kind of life we lead. So we really need to examine our beliefs and um, our views. And I think my experience of my spiritual practice is a continual um, examining of my beliefs about the world and a continual realizing what beliefs I have. If you see what I mean, it's kind of like it's like a layer of onions and on, layers of onions. It's like I, I realize some beliefs I have about the world which aren't helpful, and then there's another one yet that I hadn't even known I believed. It's like so many of these are unconscious, we don't even know that that's what we think the world is like, and yet that's what we are acting from, we act from that place, we act from that place. And often the, our maps of the world will have been conditioned when we were very young. 
Uh, so we might, you know, some people will have a sense of a world in which, I don't know, it's very, um, it's a magical world and people keep giving them presents and everything's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so other people will have a sense of the world in which they're not loved, life is really difficult. Um, you know, they try but they don't succeed. And those maps we have, they will really determine how we lead our lives. As the Buddha said, that the maps that most humans have are wrong. They're wrong. They're just leading us into more suffering. And they're topsy-turvy. It's a bit like we're all lost. We're all blundering about. Because what we do, of course, is we think, oh, um, I really want this. I can see that what I really want is a lovely holiday, which might be good, but um, or I, want a, I really want whatever it is. I want a new iPad. And I really want it. And when I get it, then I will be really happy. And of course, for a while, I mean, a holiday does lead us to being happy, and a new iPad can lead to some happiness. But what will happen is actually the suffering we've had is from the craving, if you see what I mean? So it's a bit like we're caught in this cycle of we just want, want, want things all the time. The suffering is coming from the craving itself. And that is the map that we're living in. We're living in a map where we think if only we could just get it all sorted out, if only we can arrange all the deck chairs on the Titanic exactly right, then everything will be fine. But it won't. <laughs> it won't. It won't. Um, and it's the Buddha, that's what the Buddha can teach us is a different map, a different map. So what the Buddha called his uh, views, uh, though, if you remember the Noble Eightfold Path, is a right view. So right to view. And they're a positive example of relative truth, the teachings of the Buddha. And we can decide that we're going to take those on. So we can decide that I can see that many of the uh, maps I have, the map I have of the world, it's inaccurate. It's been formed from all sorts of places and it's not right. But the map that the Buddha can give me and his teachings, his Dharma can give me, it is much more useful. So I can decide to take that on as an active choice. So, um, you know, for instance, I could de um, decide that I'm going to follow the precepts because they seem to me to be a way that will lead to my happiness and the happiness of others. And they seem to be in alliance with reality. So I can take the choice that those are going to be my map now so that when it comes to a decision, I'm going to think, is it ethical? Is it skillful? Does it fit with the precepts? Not, uh, you know, so will it lead to my freedom in the long run? Not, will it give me more pleasure? in the short term. So I can use a different map for living my life much more in accordance with reality. And it really doesn't mean right view is not like taking on some kind of a dogma or signing up to a creed or something like that. It's just taking that active choice yourself that you think the map that the Buddha and the Dharma teaches is a map that seems to be more accurate and you want to follow it. And that would involve really looking at all our conditioned views, all those ideas we have about ourselves, and challenging them, being prepared to challenge them. And interesting, actually, Nagarjuna himself uh, just deconstructed all these views so much that it even extended to the basic ideas of the Dharma. And he wanted to do that because the Dharma had got really literal. Buddhism had got really literal at that time. He wanted to blow it apart. I think he's been called something like the great exploder or something like that. This great dynamite explosive person because he blew uh, the teachings apart. Because, you know, the Buddha didn't see those verbal teachings that he gave in the Pali Canon as the absolute truth. They're a raft to get to the other shore. And we need to leave that raft behind when we get to the other shore. So the raft is a really interesting kind of metaphor that we can use. Perhaps it seems in the gardener's time, there were lots of people who actually just wanted to leave that, uh, who, came, who got over the other side, and were taking the raft with them as well. And they should have been leaving it behind. Or maybe there were a whole load of people who were actually really like having a great time decorating and furnishing the raft, but <laughs> never pushing it out into the, into the river to cross the river. But we also have to be really careful that we don't take this teaching that you leave the raft behind to think that the raft is worthless and that we jump off it too soon. We need the raft. We need the raft of those teachings of the Buddha, even if they are ultimately empty of, of, of their, their, their shunyata, they are empty, empty of um, absolute truth. They are conventional truth and we need them. So if people try and jump off the raft too soon, that, that's not a good idea. They will drown. <laughs> they will drown. So it's like we need right view until we have perfect view. And we just really need to look at those views. 
And of course, we'll have all sorts of views, like as I've said, which come from all sorts of places. So one is just the physiology we have, the biology we have. You know, this um, looks a certain way to us, this um, thing here that I've now forgotten the name of. And um, <laughs> lectern, thank you. To, um, to an ant, it would seem very different, wouldn't it? A little ant crawling about it would have a very different central experience of it. A vulture up in the air would have a completely different experience of it. It is not a, um, you know, all of us have a different physiologies, and because of that, we see the world in different ways. Our ideas often come from our culture. There are many ideas that are deeply embedded into our culture that we can't even think to challenge. And I've told this before, but I remember uh, talking once with a, an Iranian guy about free speech. That was just an intrinsic value to me that I've always thought was completely, you wouldn't even think that you wouldn't want free speech. And he said to me, or free speech to say what? And I just thought that was a really interesting question. It was like, you know, there was a value I'd completely taken that, of course, we wanted free speech, and I'd never even thought it through. And it was a view I just held because of my culture. I'm not saying that free speech is, is either good or bad here, okay? I'm just trying to use it as an example of something that we have as a view. Um, you know, there's lots of in our cultures things around individualism, materialism, lots of views that we might hold and we might not realise that in other cultures they see things differently. So actually sometimes going abroad or trying to live abroad can be really helpful because you can see those different views that people live by. We'll have had loads of values, uh, views about the world from our, our family and our friends. So lots of ways that we um, have unconscious ways of seeing at the world. Yeah, so we might decide to take on some... Um, Buddhist ideas. And how might we do that? So obviously we might take on the five precepts. Something else we might take on is perhaps uh, just really reflecting on some of the Buddha's teachings. So such as the three lakshanas. So you remember the three things that we teach at the very beginning of the newcomer's course. All things are impermanent, which means that we can all change, for instance. So how would I reflect on that? How would I really try to get to know that? Well, I think there's something about giving myself time to think about it, reflect on it in meditation, but also to discuss it with other people. So that's why we have discussion groups, like after these talks and things. It's because we can really think about our views in those discussion groups. And we can start to try, um, if we want to, move towards having a much more kind of dharmic view of things. You know, really pull it apart. So, you know, so for instance, impermanence. Is everything impermanent in my experience? Do I really believe that? Can I think of anything that is permanent? Um, what would it apply to my life if I did know that everything was impermanent? You know, that I knew I was impermanent. It's about we need to really contemplate, to really know in our guts the Dharma, so that we can really get to know it in a deep way. Because that's the kind of wisdom we're talking about, the kind of wisdom where we just really know it in our guts. It's not just something that we understand some ideas. So this wisdom here is really talking about a direct seeing into the nature of reality. And we often get, you know, we do get glimpses of this. We shouldn't feel that it's something far away from us at all. We do get glimpses of this. So just to kind of come back to, um, to sum up. So, um, so Nagarjuna tells us there's no phenomena whatsoever that have inherent selfhood. Everything is without inherent existence. Actually, nothing is as we think it is. So there's nothing permanent to grasp onto. There's no fixed self to grasp onto anything. All there is is an ever-changing process. So there's no permanent substance whatsoever anywhere. And we're part of that ever-changing process. And we're changing all the time, however much we might try and resist that fact. And what we can do is we can maximise our chances of developing into wiser and more compassionate beings if we can see that there's no point in grasping or fixing to anything, including views and labels. But we should also use intelligently, without clinging onto them, the teachings that the Buddha's given to us. So in that way, we're able to direct the change, the inevitable change, direct it in a positive direction. So it's about living in line as much as we can with reality. So until such time as we're enlightened, as we know shunyata, shunyata, nature of reality for ourselves, until then we need to use these relative concepts and ideas, these ideas that have the taste of freedom to liberate ourselves. So I think it's a kind of paradox, isn't it? We need to know the absolute truth, the shunyata, and we need to be in the, con in the um, conventional or relative truth as well. 
I think this paradox is kind of really beautifully embodied in the Bodhisattva ideal. So that sublime idea of the Mahayana. Because a Bodhisattva knows that there are no beings. And yet, in fact, because there are no beings, they have compassion and love for all.